Good evening. Just state your name and topic uh, address and topic to be addressed. Uh, my name is Kim Baller, and um, I live between Galesville and Melrose. Um, I'd like to address the board to ask if there could be any consideration for a virtual on-school full-time option for the Holman School District, the Holman School District. Okay. Okay, thank you. If that's all the comments you have to make, just so you know, we don't usually respond to public comments. Um, Dr. Carlson will respond to you on our behalf, and um, that will op open up that line of communication. Is there anyone else who, and I think Christina may want to get your address so that, um, for the record, and so that she can communicate with you. Anyone else who would like to address the board at this time? Okay, seeing none, <laughs> then we'll move on to district administrator's report, Dr. Carlson. Two items in addition to the written report. First of all, uh, we were discovered this after we put the board packet um, together. Some wonderful news. Roger King, Holman High School agri-science teacher, what, found out last week <clears throat> that he has been named a 2015 Herb Cole Foundation Fellow recipient. This is quite an, an honor um, throughout the state. and. Um, it's really one of the top recognitions that an individual teacher can receive. So um, again, we will look to invite Roger to a future board meeting for recognition. And we're just uh, so proud of him and um, look forward to having him here with us. So congratulations to Mr. Roger King. Also, just to bring your attention, your ongoing up, uh, calendar coming up, there is the CESA outreach, board outreach, scheduled for March 26th. And this is where a gentleman from DPI is planning to come and talk more specifically about the budget impact, uh, finance impact on school districts. Um, as of late last week, there is low registration. They do need to know first thing in the morning tomorrow if, uh, from school districts who is attending. Now, I do believe, for us, it does conflict with, there's something else, Ms. Jagosinski, <coughs> going on Thursday night. Yep, like so, dinner. Right, the celebrity waiters dinner. So, and I know some of you are signed up and planning to <laughs> attend that as well. So, um, anyway, we do need to know, though, for sure, before you leave tonight, if you could let Christina know <coughs> if you plan to attend the board outreach. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then reports and discussion, um, referendum update. Tonight we're going to get a report from facility maintenance and fleet replacement. Looks like John is coming forward. Uh, can you get that turned off, Jan? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jan. Um, tonight I'm going to give you uh, um, my portion of, of the, uh, of the uh, public meetings, the informational meetings we've been having. Um, as you know, uh, Dr. Carlson starts the meeting off with kind of an overall view for those of you who haven't been to one yet. And, um, and then we break out into groups, a financial table uh, headed by Jay and uh, and uh, Jan does the, gives information on IT. Elisa also helps with the financial part too. And uh, um, Beth does the transportation, transportation portion and then I do the uh, buildings and grounds. I think you heard from Jan at the last meeting. Um, so this is, this is my presentation of what I do at these, short presentation of what I do at these meetings. So, so what we do is we, uh, we're focusing on a number of questions within the uh, district's uh, um, um, question and answer portions that, that we have on, on the, the website. One of my questions is why do we need more money, money uh, for maintenance of facilities? Well, in 2013, the Buildings and Grounds Facility Committee did a study on uh, cap, uh, facility capital improvements and funding options for those improvements. The results of our study showed that our existing budget was insufficient to meet our capital improvement needs. At that time, the funding fell short by about $250,000. Since that time, the school board has added $75,000 to the capital improvements budget. That still left us with $175,000 to, 
to fund in some other way, which is what we are asking for in that, that particular question. Um, I'd like to show you a couple, uh, couple of graphs, a couple slides here showing the spending and, and uh, deferred projects. This graph shows spending and also the funding source of that spending. Uh, general fund, sinking fund, um, um, the uh, uh, building fund, um, the referendum, which is, which is the, uh, uh, the sources of dollars we put away when we built uh, Sand Lake and, and Prairie View. Um, the sinking fund, we call that. It it's also shows uh, planned spending and deferred maintenance. You'll, you'll note that deferred maintenance in red here. Um, you'll note the, do, the blue dollars back here show, that show up in 2008 and 9. that's referendum dollars. Referendum dollars from uh, uh, capital improvements uh, that we spent at Evergreen and Viking back in 2008. Um, this has been a strategy the district has used uh, for many years. When we would have a building project, we would also look at um, some of our capital improvement needs and, and, and include them within uh, building referendums. Uh, we've always underfunded our capital improvement needs. So this was a strategy we used. Um, as growth has slowed and the need for new facilities has also slowed, um, we haven't had any referendums to include these capital improvement needs with. Um, the deferred maintenance that you see starting to show up here in 1516 really didn't start there. They, we actually had them back here, but they've just grown. In fact, this next graph is, a, is a, shows just the, uh, um, the actual spending, actual funding, and you'll note here all these, this is, uh, um, our deficiency with the capital improvements. Um, some of these, some of these projects that show up here, all of a sudden, is rise. We're actually back here, but as we as we move forward, we can't just leave them behind. We we have to push them push them ahead. So it's kind of uh, I compare this to like a wave. This is a huge wave that's heading our our way, and we we've, we've got to address it in some way. <clears throat> or else that way will just get higher and higher. The uh, Buildings and Grounds Facility Committee looked at 17 different options, and here they are, for different funding solutions to meet capital maintenance needs. Um, one of them was efficiency. Um, and, um, and uh, of course, one of them was, uh, um, was, was for a referendum as well. I want to talk about the efficiency a, a little bit. Um, this graph shows you how Holman compares to other MVC school districts. Um, on this table, this shows our cost per square foot that we spend on buildings and grounds and facilities. This includes everything from projects to day-to-day -day maintenance to labor costs and, every, um, and all of that. We, we spend here in Holman about $4.68 a square foot on our on our on our facilities the MVC average is five dollars and eighty cents I, sh I show this this graph shows up in our annual report every year and we add to it as we get the information um, um, the, the important the, the the thing I also point out in the annual meeting is there's a reason why there's a gap here it's not well it's, it, yeah I, I like to think we're really efficient with our with our dollars and, and we are um, but, uh, oops, but the uh, um, fact of the matter is we don't spend nearly as much on capital improvements as other school districts do. This little green triangle here, I hope you can see that, will sh would show the, um, uh, where our spending would be if we added the $175,000. We'd still be much lower than the MVC average. We'd go from 466. And if we would have added $175,000, we would be at 489 per square foot. Still much lower than the MVC average of $5.80 a foot. Um, this is just a graph that shows um, our utility costs. And it just shows uh, part of our efficiencies since we started our conservation program back in 2006. 
the red line the the blue line shows our actual utility costs through that period of time the red line shows our what our cost calculated would have been had we have done absolutely nothing with energy conservation so we so we are pretty pretty efficient um, one of the other questions is what's the downside to lower level of spending lower level of spending for capital improvements will result in the deterioration of the buildings and grounds that the electorate in this district has supported um, over the years our job is to be a faithful steward of those facilities um, that have been provided we believe we need to maintain them and make them last 75 to 100 years um, studies show that each dollar of preventive maintenance missed will ultimately cost four dollars in deferred maintenance and repair if we don't do it today it'll cost much more tomorrow and these are just some pictures of some needs throughout the district and that's my presentation any questions are there any questions John would you just clarify for the audience and I know we have media present too the performance measures that many of them that we do so for example the cost per square foot um, is that something that's common out there um, among our MVC and region that they keep track of that no that's something that's not very common I, I've uh, asked my cohorts I've had um, uh, people um, vendors in here who go online and look at those things we say they say they don't just don't see that stuff in other buildings so uh, but we've always we've taken the position here that if it's important we're going to measure it and we do measure it so we intentionally reach out to our neighboring school districts ask them for yes we get that information from footage, the taxpayers the cost. alliance and, and then and then I reach out to those folks how many square feet yeah. are you guys maintaining and and I create we yeah. created that um, the, the dollars come right out of Madison that those reports come right out of Madison they're online anybody can see them um, I, I, the reason I can't compare it to the state average is I'd have to call every school in the state and just want to be clear so that if someone goes to another school district and they're asking for that specific information they may not have that that's something that we have put together ourselves yes. as yeah. far as the comparison and I and in advance Beth of your presentation similar with some of your performance measures thank you so Beth I'll let you go. Thanks. Hello. Good Hello. evening. Good evening. Hi. So I am here to talk about fleet replacement and what the dollars we're asking for will be used for fleet replacement. I also, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I also have uh, went with some of the questions that are in the question and answers that are on the website and that we hand out at the meetings. And my first question that I started with was what is the downside to lower level of spending? And the lower levels of spending in the areas of transportation fleet replacement will eventually and already result in a greater cost. Deferring f fleet replacement will only create greater operational costs in the long run. We all know the story that um, a vehicle will start to nickel and dime us to death. So in my first uh, graph that I have, it just shows you an example of <coughs> what something that you can show you how our fleet is aging. Every year we, the DOT comes in, inspects our buses. This is mandatory for school buses from the federal government. They come and inspect. And as you can see, uh, we are, the average number of defe defects per vehicle, excuse me, is in the pink. So we're pretty good per vehicle. We stay under, under two per defects. Average days lost for out of service, that very fluctuates depending on what it is. If it's a part that takes a long time to get, we get up there to the 12 days. And as you can see down here, 2015, we did really well with the average days lost. Average days to repair non out of service, that's a little bit higher. And then the percentage of vehicles with category defects is pretty high. So that's. Uh, where we're uh, getting a little bit nervous because that's starting to climb and so is the average days they're all starting to all you can see they're all starting to go up also we have pictures of some of this is one vehicle that uh, after the DOT inspection we did have to put out of service 
there uh, this is the undercarriage of the bus and as you know the new th stuff they're putting on the road is corroding the buses faster we do wash all of our buses once or twice a, a month to keep to try to keep them clean and keep that rust off you can see on this side this is door damage this is stuff we could fix but with this substantial structure damage it's <coughs> just it, it's not worth replacing a bus that's on this <coughs> is actually a bus that is 21 years old so our average buses that we have in our fleet are between 0 and 22 years old. Uh, the, right now I have nine buses that are 18 years or older. Our average fleet age is 12. If you average all of them together, we would like to get down to nine. So in the next question that we then go to on our referendum is why not meet financial needs with improvement to efficiency? So we want, we always say that, we always tell you how cost effective we are and how we doing our routing and picking, putting lots of students on our buses, how that keeps us underneath the average of the rest of the MVC. So on this chart, you can see the MVC is in the pink and their average with all of the MVC groups is about 60 cents, 66 cents per pupil mile. So each and our average right now is 52 cents and that's what we have from last year so now with and then within the little green dot like John had on his the green triangle if we added that hundred and sixty thousand to our budget we would go up to 56 cents which is still way below the MVC average Oh, I also want to, uh, along with the improvements to efficiency, we also do a survey that shows how uh, our customers rate us every year. This is our third year we've been doing a survey. And as long as we're the really good would be in the green, you've seen these surveys before. So we just <coughs> wanted to show the, the public that people are satisfied with our transportation along with us being efficient. My third question I, I had uh, from the referendum is why is more money needed for fleet replacement? And the district has a long range fleet replacement schedule. So this shows more of, of how our average fleet is in years is in the left hand column. This is where I was telling you where we would like to be and where we are. So uh, and on the bottom is the years that we're in going out to 2018. So if you look at where we are coming up in 2014 and where we would be with the dollars if we in the blue line would see where we will be keep going if we don't get any money to replace buses and then the purplish line is where we could start getting close getting our gap closer to where we should be which is that nine year average the last question that I uh, that is one of the questions from the referendum is why doesn't the district contract transportation services we just wanted to show you in a different way of the cost per pupil mile uh, graph is how we get those numbers so we have our MVC schools La Crosse on Alaska Sparta and Toma and the, through the DPI report we pull out these numbers on how much they spend per cost per pupil mile in La Crosse was 96 cents last year <coughs> on Alaska was 107 Sparta 46 cents, Toma 54 cents, Holman was 52 cents. Now of, in the yellow, those are the schools that contract school buses and in the blue, those are the ones that own their own school buses. So if you look towards the bottom there, the average contracting cost is 83 cents for those schools to contract. The average non-contracting cost is 53 cents for those that own their own fleets. So that's one of our arguments of why we want to stay owning our own buses. Thank you. Any questions? Are there any questions? <coughs> Thank you for that last slide. I know that is a question that comes up and we tell folks it's and it's not just the financial part of it, but we want to we've studied that we feel it's more desirable for us to be able to hire our bus drivers, instill our values um, in them, make sure that they are responsible to, you know, our district. And what you're showing us is that financially it makes more sense also to have our own fleet. So so thank you. So it's good to have that continuity. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah. So. Well, and I know that um, in the the 
one session that I did attend the presentation, I think the only negative I have heard so far about the referendum has been that question from a couple individuals okay. about, especially question number two and the fact that it is continuous, you know, forever or whatever. And I always want to say, yes, well, as long as my house is standing, I need to maintain it. As long as I live in the suburbs, I need to be able to get places. As long as we transport our students, we need to be able to, to mm -hmm. afford those <clears throat> things. And the question is very specific in saying that until the board decides to rescind it and that is something that future boards can do is if they want to rescind the um, revenue exemption they have the authority to do that and so there are those safeguards in there um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a forever but I I don't know someone's gonna have to convince me that it's not gonna be forever so but thank you Beth and John And so then moving on to employee handbook language revisions. Hello. Melissa, I didn't All know right. if you were going to come and add something yeah. about the reference. <laughs> <laughs> I can if you'd like me to. Okay, so we have two really quick items tonight um, that have gone to the employee relations team and the personal and governance committee. Um, the first one is under the post-employment benefits, and you'd find this. Um, we have post-employment benefits under almost all the parts of our handbook, all employees, the teachers, the hourly staff, and the administrators and supervisors. Um, the language that you see in there is not a change. We're just doc documenting some practice um, that we didn't have written down currently, so just adding that into that language. The second piece that um, we have is under the hourly employees and the employee resignation section. And this really just applies to those hourly employees who work during the school year only. Um, so this is a change from current practice. Um, and really what you'll see in there is language that encourages those staff who may not be returning the following school year to submit a resignation by July 1st. Um, we all know, I know Cheryl has talked um, many times about the rigorous hiring process that we have and um, when someone gives us a notice two weeks before the start of the school year it's very difficult to get someone in um, and filling that position and ensuring that there's no hiccups in that school year as it's starting off so just encouraging people to submit by July 1st is all it is there's um, no repercussions if they don't but just a uh, nice so any questions and I don't think those are on tonight. No, they'll be on for the April 13th for consent. And the copy, you do have a copy of those in the, your folder. Thank you, Melissa. Then preliminary staffing report, Dr. Carlson. Well, this is somewhat unique. Uh, I don't always do this. Um, typically, the staffing report has been presented to the board, the first board meeting, or even the second board meeting in April. And then you're asked, you've been asked to approve it at the following meeting. I've chosen to present kind of a preliminary to that report um, tonight. One of the reasons is because of the unique situation that we find ourselves in related to the governor's budget proposal. And I feel that I want to give the board as much advance notice as possible so that you can start thinking about and reflecting on what I present tonight as far as what staffing, what you may expect as far as a recommendation from administration for staffing for 2015-16. Now, if I don't say it at the end either, I think that um, what I will be planning is for April 13th, first of all, you'll get much more specifics, especially when I talk about some um, positions such as the data-related positions. But also on April 13th, I plan to present uh, to the board a little bit of perhaps a, an alternative, alternative to the preliminary budget presented back in February so that you can start, it can kind of put things together a little bit. Again, it's unusual just because of uh, the delay that we've put on the budget process as well as what we possibly are facing 
at the state level with funding. So this evening, I'm just going to take you through <clears throat> some ideas, some possible recommendations that you will see on April 13th as part of the staffing report. Let me just start out with instruction. This is more dealing with the instruction in the classroom, some ideas, some thoughts of where we're at and what I will likely be recommending and presenting. So tonight, I'll go through each one of these specific, but our public preschool, elementary level, middle school, and high school, and you can kind of see there a little bit of just a summary of what I'm going to present here more specifically. So at our public preschool level, right now, uh, this would not Come, should not come to a surprise to the board because uh, we've already been talking this year about the increase in enrollment and the needs um, within our early childhood program. In fact, at a recent board meeting, we asked you to approve a limited term position for the remainder of this school year. This was in the preliminary, that, preliminary, that draft preliminary um, budget report um, back in, on February 9th as well. Related to that would be the addition of a seven-hour special education um, assistant that would typically go along with, if you add a classroom in the early childhood program, you would be adding an assistant, an educational assistant as well. <coughs> so those are a couple things. We, we, obviously, we continue to monitor our three-year-old our three-year-olds coming in for next school year that may change some of this as we as we go ahead and we do as far as the 4k itself we at this point do not anticipate a change in staffing level but again as you know 4k is one of perhaps our difficult most difficult grade levels of projecting we look at our trend data and try to do our best as far as predicting that At the elementary level, so grades kindergarten through grade five, <clears throat> at this time, the enrollment projections would suggest no change in the number um, of classroom sections. We currently are at 79 sections. Uh, we do anticipate a slight increase in overall student enrollment. Um, the kindergarten continues to be a challenge of um, really estimating and projecting as well. Um, I do want to say elementary principals um, have not, again, this report is earlier than typical. We have yet, we're going to be meeting this week and really examining the data, the projections closer per grade level, per building. And that really, uh, while we've done some preliminary work, um, really now the, the, uh, actually the elementary principals are going to work on that as well this week. So this is very preliminary, but that's early on, that's what we are projecting at this point. <clears throat> Middle school, what I will likely present is an overall um, change in that full-time employment, that FTE, and working very briefly uh, uh, with Mr. Vogler at this point, again, we don't anticipate any overall FTE change. There might be some, for example, math is one area that high school and middle school have been sharing for a number of years, um, where most likely it's been a high school staff member that travels over to middle school. We're working on a plan that um, this year, in order for that high school person to do that, it actually resulted in an overload. And we do have a, a math teacher at the middle school currently who's um, not full-time. So we're going to do some further work on that, and hopefully by April 13th, we're able to bring you a final plan on how to do that. But in the end, um, it should have pretty close to no net change in the FT at the middle school. It should come to no surprise that probably the, every year, the most complex uh, piece to the staffing plan is when we look at the high school, uh, our largest. So the plan that you can expect at this point to receive would demonstrate an overall net change of an increase of a little over one FTE. Um, there's a lot of, I've worked closely with Mr. Bear and, and Mr. Weber's here as well as assisted. Um, we, they, they do great work closely examining every single subject 
every department, everything that, that our students sign up for. So as I note on the slide, the changes are driven by what students choose and select. That's what we do every year. We, we try to do as best as we can to keep it pr fairly smooth. So in any given course or subject area, we're not going up and down, up and down. Now one way we do that over the years has been perhaps that overload um, alternative. But anymore, we're trying to minimize those as well. And we think that there's a pretty good plan that we'll be able to present. There is likely to be staffing increases in our English, English language art area, as well as our science area. And those are showing some increases based on student selection, using pretty much the same uh, guidelines as in determining a classroom section that we have used in the past. We are looking at some, just like we're showing increases in student selection in English language arts and science, for example, we're showing some reductions in Spanish, social studies, and French. But um, as I note down at the bottom, even those reductions, it doesn't result in, uh, for example, a, a, a re we call it reduction in force, a, a layoff. There won't be that coming to the board as a result of any reductions with the high school plan. Um, I do note an increase in guidance. We, this is something that we have been looking at, uh, monitoring closely each year for the past number of years. As our student enrollment has continued to grow, um, our guidance department, again, it's been, I want to say it's about, been about eight to nine years since we um, have increased in our guidance department at all. About seven to eight or nine years ago is when we moved from a part-time so we had two point, I think 2.5, 2.75 positions in our guidance department. And then about <clears throat> eight years ago or so, we moved to three. And so this would be something that we are looking at. Um, it would not most likely end up in a full time, but we have a, we have a creative idea of something we've been looking at, of uh, perhaps putting it together with another part-time position that we think would work very well within guidance. And um, one of those ideas is even in the area of talented and gifted. And it would it perhaps even bring some stability to our programming and our service there. So this is something that's not um, driven by enrollment in the classroom as a classroom teacher need, but overall our ongoing issues and needs to help serve kids um, were really you can likely expect to have this part of the recommendation. <clears throat> as far as district positions, right now, and I want to say that this is very tentative. I, I had hoped to be in a better position this evening, quite honestly, to talk more specific. I would say to you that, that um, while it should not come to a surprise to you that we talk about the data positions. We've been talking about that for some time. And I know even our consultant, uh, Mr. Fail, has mentioned that in his work with the board as well. We still are trying to get it, I would have to say, perfect. As perfect as it can be. And even in the last week, we're looking at different, different options, different ways to go about this. So what I can share with you tonight, again, is that um, we are looking at, we have some draft descriptions that are, gonna, that are continually being revised. Um, one of the positions would most likely focus, you can kind of see some possible titles, um, a specialist position, which probably would be more on par with, we have benefit specialists in the school district, but also uh, talking with Mrs. Weave and as late as today, uh, talking about you know what software specialist type of um, positions and what that entails. This would be looking at a 12-month position most likely, and um, but we're still trying to iron out the details on what the qualifications would be, and as far as attracting that type of person into that position, that position would most likely 
uh, do a, quite a bit with our school information system, Infinite Campus. Um, and, um, but going beyond that right now, I, I, I want to make sure I'm solid on some of the ideas that we have that before I really lay it out for you. Um, so that will come more specifically on April 13th, along with the rest of the staffing plan. And if, if any of these parts of the staffing plan need to be separated out for more discussion, that can certainly happen. And I will also mention how maybe some of this plays into the budget issue as well. The other position right now is more of a position focused in instructional services. That specialist position could find itself more in the IT area uh, um, under information and technology. The assessment and data um, assessment position would be in the instructional services as that has continued just to grow tremendously over the years. And so again, um, more refining needs to be done with, with that position as far as, uh, in fairness to you, as far as laying that out and what that specifically looks like. One of the pieces that I had mentioned back in February too is a possibility is we've had a clerical position in instructional services that has actually gone unfilled this year. That was intentional as uh, during the summer and end of the summer and entering into the school year because of my expectation and really even with Mrs. Savasky, I wanted to make sure what are our greatest priorities right now. And so this is something that might be part of this overall plan that um, kind of a trade-off of some of the other, a combination of the specialist and or the coordinator or manager position that we might um, not continue with that secretarial position. I would just ask that you give us a little bit more time and that I'm able to come back to you and talk more specifically about that. Um, but what we have done this year, by the way, um, there's been some things that we've actually contracted out just to um, not, not a great deal, but we've done some contracting of services on very targeted things uh, with that <clears throat> position that we have left unfilled this school year. I, I show you a projected net total projected cost if you put all three of those together. But again, that's very tentative. It's just meant to give you kind of a ballpark idea. And again, job descriptions and titles still need to, are still being worked on. And we'll present those. If we can get this together, either one or both positions, and we feel confident that we have something that will best meet our needs, we'll present that to you and we'll be ready to do so. Pupil services will be a separate report as it has been in the past. And so a summary, just putting together for you, um, again, if you look at the early childhood position at the, in the public preschool, along with the high school positions and the other grade levels, you'd be looking at a, a little over a two FTE increase in, in positions related specifically to the classroom. The uh, special education assistant, the um, cost of approximately $30,000. I listed the two district level data positions. In this slide, it's separate from the IS secretary position. I, I list both of those separately for you. Again, that previous slide, you, if you combine that, that's where you get that net change. Um, the net cost increase would be approximately around that $300,000 amount. I just uh, wanted to share with you, if you go back to your budget planning, the initial budget variable um, for increased staffing in the classroom, if you recall, was about 1.19%, and that equated to about four FTE positions. And so, and that's at about a $300,000 cost to those four positions, or 1.19%. So that is what is in that um, preliminary budget work that the board had done. Draft, uh, so again, the draft preliminary report um, included the early childhood program or position, and it also included the two data positions separate from those four FTEs. 
So in the preliminary budget report back on February 9th, you had a little bit more than $500,000 in that, in that uh, preliminary report. And again, the board has chosen, and I supported and agreed, just to delay that for a little bit um, until we finalize that preliminary report. But just throwing some numbers out for you, in there, it's a little over $500,000 that was in that, that report. So we have a long time to go in monitoring student enrollment projections, especially at the elementary level. Um, that's one of the reasons why you initially looked at a contingency to give some flexibility as we go along. So final thought, um, obviously how do we balance the need for the increased staffing recommendations with the potential budget challenges we are facing given the governor's budget proposal. Some of the things just keep out in front of us, and you've done an excellent, you've done, uh, this is where, what you've done in the past. You've kept class size as a high priority. Um, stu simply serving students and placing priorities on that, and then also your commitment to making decisions based on data. Those are some of the categories that you'll likely see presented as part of the overall staffing plan. And again, also on April 13th, I would plan to present potential alternatives for you to consider as we continue to wait for the work by the state on the governor's budget proposal. I think that will be important for you to have, so you can have both, so as we move forward with those decisions, okay? So this is, again, just a very preliminary report to you tonight. I would be happy to take some questions as best as I can, even though I know some of this is still being worked on. Any questions? Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. Dr. Carlson, then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Are there any items that you would like to have considered separately this evening? 10.5, please. Okay, 10.5, which is the resolution. Any other items? Okay, if not, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented with the exception of 10.5. Is there a motion? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Okay, a motion's been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda um, items as presented with the exception of item 10.5. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Okay, so ten item 10.5 is the state budget resolution. Um, do we have a motion to approve the state budget resolution as presented? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded. I'll let you pick, Kate. Um, discussion. Yeah, I, some, some, yeah, I got some questions about it. I just was wondering, how, how did we come about doing it? What was the, uh, what was the the financials that we determined to make this statement besides I know that other school districts did it but what any other reasons besides that I mean, asked if we could have it on the agenda I'm sorry I didn't mean to okay. interrupt you but I, just thought I, but I think you were you were asking about the financials well I mean in order for, I know I this is just a mm -hmm. I think it's just a surface thing right it's probably not going to go anywhere but I mean that was the, the idea is we're showing that we don't agree with the budget that he's proposing correct Correct. By, by, by approving this, I think that would be, the board would be making a statement that they don't agree with the uh, budget as presented by Governor Walker at this point in time. Okay. Yeah, I, I cannot vote for this. I, I won't vote for it. And it's not because I don't believe in the school district of Holman. I wrote down some notes that I just felt, I feel really compelled to share them. And it's not negative, I promise you. That's okay, Tom, please um, share. But I do, I do think that um, in order for me to sign a resolution or to agree to a resolution like this, I would have to have a lot of data to research. And I, need to, and I would need to, to, to mill through it and figure out just where we are and, and, I, and completely say, yeah, I agree with this, we need to have our money back or we need to go forward with this. I, I don't quite feel that way. Um, I did my own research, and uh, I based my decision on three different things. Innovation as it relates to the quality of our product, history of decisions in the district, and how student-centric are the answers for one and two. I'm not gonna read this whole thing. But um, so in my research, and I, since we're asking for money, 
I decided to see what the difference between private and public schools were. And they aren't comparable. I understand they're not comparable. But if you remove the transportation facilities, the food and community service costs, they are more similar in some ways. And when you remove those from the DPI website, we're still anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000 more dollars per student. And that's okay. I'm, I'm not complaining about that because I, I'm, I have, as all of you know, I'm self-employed and I have a company that I charge more than anybody else. So I, I, that's okay. I think it's okay to have an expensive uh, product if it's worth it, if it's worth it though. And history is one of the biggest indicators, in my opinion, on validating an opinion or to make a stand. I, in my limited time on the board, and I was gonna make a comment that I, one, next month we may have one year anniversary. <laughs> um, we've asked, my wife and I asked over ten, almost 10 years ago about an internet school for Holman, and we, and we still aren't doing that, but hopefully we will someday. Um, with the amount of money we charge, I don't know if we have a STEM program in the works, or if we have some STEM pedagogy we have in, in the works. Again, I'm not on the education committee, so I don't have that background. So, but that's something we need, I think. We, if we charge this much, we should be miles above any other competitor. So uh, STEM, I think, is really important. Uh, the class sizes, that's something else. Maybe modify some of the class sizes. I would have a survey of the teachers and see what they think our district, where, it's, where the direction goes. They're the most ones in the field. They're the ones that had the best data that we can learn from. I don't know if that's been done. I like to think it has, but maybe it hasn't. Um, I, in 2006, when I attended the Holman High School orientation, I asked the guidance counselor, what about the early start times and the <laughs> fatigue factor? And she said, they are tired, but they wake up at their nine o'clock snack. Well, that's not acceptable in my opinion. <coughs> and it also, in, in regards to the educators, how does that affect their grades? How does that affect their product they're working with? I would imagine starting that early, some teachers have a hill to climb every morning of, of tired kids. And this isn't in 2011, 2012, Carrie Treadway, a former board member, had the same question. I was sitting <coughs> in the audience and she wanted to modify the schedule and it never happened. We still don't have a modified schedule. How does that affect a teacher's effectiveness? The Courier Life recently published ACT scores. They were not stellar. Uh, why is that? Are the teachers all bad in middle school? Or is it the early start times? I don't know. But these are realistic concerns I have for our district. I voted yes for both referendums and I stand behind that vote. When Travis Koloski was here last board meeting, I asked him directly, how many of your peers are as comfortable with, with technology as you are? He said, none. And he said it as a joke. I didn't think it was very funny, but he's a, he was obviously he's exceptional in what he does. I think he's a really good teacher. And I'm not surprised. I've never been disappointed when I've gone out in the field and met these teachers. We have a great staff. But his comment was the same comment the library and media person said, I asked her biggest annoyance was teachers coming up asking about technology. So, and I, the last thing was, I was at festival the other day and, a, and a, one of our, one of our uh, community members came up to me asked, and asked me this question. She says, what is the difference in technology from a student looking up at the teacher or looking down at the, at the technology? And I didn't have a really good answer. I, I don't know. So, but I told her, I said, I voted for it and I vote for the teachers, and so that's, that's where that went. But I know this sounds negative, and I don't mean it to sound negative. It's really important that you people think that I believe in this school, but I also think I'm a friend, I'm not a buddy, I'm gonna tell you what I think we need to do, and we are not staying on track, and that's why I cannot vote for this resolution, because I don't think we have earned it in some ways. Now, last comment I'll say, I moved here in 1998, for many reasons, one being the schools. We pulled our kids out in 2006. As a highlight for Holman, my kids attended band and they got perfect attendance, <coughs> I think almost the entire time. I credit, I credit George Von Arx and we have an exceptional educator with Michelle Jensen, she's maintained that. My kids loved coming here for band. They also were diametrically different from the first semester to the second because the first semester they had to be here at seven <coughs> in the morning for band. They never missed it because they loved it 
Second semester, they had to be here by 10. The grades went up, the attitudes were better. So I think we have a systematic thing we need to look at as a district. We have a lot of good people. We have a lot of good things going on here. We need to address this if we're going to be a leading district going forward. Anyway, um, thank you okay. for, for that. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the issue? There is a motion on the floor and a second to approve the resolution related to the state budget. Anybody else? I, I guess I'll just make one comment. And Tom, in the year you've been here, I've picked up on some um, similarities in your comments. And I think they're, they're things that I've experienced as a long-term board member that we've gone through some of these decisions. And so um, I'm going to chat with Dr. Carlson and maybe we can figure out a way to, to whether we um, go through what we did as a board previously, like the start time. That's something that we did years ago. Um, the, the, and at the, the time we did it, the data showed us or told us we should be doing it differently. But we chose to do it the way that we are for a variety of reasons. And I could spend the rest of the night trying to you know, go over those with you. But I, I see some parallel ideas and some things that maybe we can figure out a way to have a conversation with that. I too am interested in the whole technology thing and how can we do things um, remotely and those sorts of things. But I, you know, again, there's a whole list of reasons why we haven't and we've taken a position as a school district to to perform and present in the way that we have so so I uh, appreciate your willingness to share um, well, and, and that's and I can I can say that I can I'm, I'm not afraid to say what I have to say yeah. I never am but I also have worked and led boards that had much less control but I just see some common themes and so I think maybe we can have a conversation with how to help you with those um, uh, because yeah how to help you understand where the board, why it came to the decisions that it did related to some of those and, and maybe ways that we can address some of those issues in the future. So I think we owe it to you and to any um, other people that are interested in those issues. So We have to constantly embrace change. It's yeah. the way we have to go. I agree. I, I still Anita. Say. I guess um, the bottom line for me is just the very last part of this resolution um, that reads that the, the school district of Holman Board of Education strongly encourages the governor and state legislature to revise the governor's budget to restore school funding in 2015 through 17 to educationally adequate levels to include no decrease in year one anticipated revenue while also providing for inflationary revenue increases in both years and I understand there was a lot of other a lot of other information that you gave us but this really is what we're addressing and that's why I'm voting for the resolution Okay, any other comments? Kate. Um, thank you, Tom, for some of the stuff you brought forward, but I'm going to nudge you a little bit, too, in the same way that you nudge me with, with things. The points you're bringing up to me are separate from this resolution, and here's what I want to talk about. The resolution speaks to some critical issues that are happening in our state right now that have that have a different, um, I need to look at them differently than what you're talking about, because much of what you're talking about, like Cheryl said, I'd be all about that. What this is talking about is that there are several issues. One is the very power that you want in a local school board. The budget is taken away from local school boards. If, school, if schools, let me finish. I, I, <laughs> I know it No, is. really, let me finish. Um, and it's quite dangerous to me that if we suddenly have more children in a school that have special needs who cannot pass the tests and therefore it looks like we have gotten a D or an F because that's what it's about, I as an elected official will lose my power and some privately owned company will come in and take over. That's one issue. Second issue, with all of the money that goes to the expansion of the voucher program, um, people need to understand voucher schools get their money drawn off first draw off the budget not us not public we have nothing in this next year we have been frozen back to the same percentage that it was in about 1998 99 now that's ridiculous to me that's ridiculous that's what this budget says though that in this next year I've got nothing but the vouchers get the first draw. I can't support that. 
for every 1,000 students that are enrolled in voucher or charters, about $8 million is taken away annually from public schools. This resolution addresses the unfairness in this and the myth that a, the expansion of vouchers does not hurt public schools. I could go on and on with statistics, but that's what this resolution says, Tom. The resolution is saying, please, Governor, don't do this to us. Don't cut us off at the expense of the things I've said already. And, and I want to nudge you to think about that. Um, in response to what you're saying, schools over the last decade have been doing really good. We are in the top three in the nation, Tom, in schools. Holman is included in that. We educate everyone. Voucher and privates do not. I'm going to repeat that. We educate everyone. It costs so much money for special ed. And by gosh, I would vote for every dollar I would put into special ed. Because the and dollar not, up front. They're not comparable. I know they're not. They're not comparable. So I, I would urge you, if I can, because I would love to see a unanimous vote on this. Um, we spent a day in Madison recently talking about the importance of school boards' voices. And so when we say, well, we'll just do this, but it won't be for anything, you know, school boards across the state are doing this. And the ones who do it unanimously have power. They have more power because legislators can say, hey, um, and on both sides. I, I sent a note to um, Mr. Voss, who is very reluctant to vote for some of the cuts that are going on in the university and the K-12 system. And I thanked him for saying, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> let's think about this. Um, so I, I'll stop now, but I, I just feel like it's really important that we could unanimously pass this. Anybody else wish to address this issue? Okay, motion has been made and seconded to approve the resolution as presented. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. Motion carries. And Tom, would you like it noted? Please. Okay. I totally get Kate's comments, too. Oh, thank you. So then, moving on to board members' reports and discussion. I'll call on board members in the order of the roll call and ask to present any comments or committee reports that you may have. Anita Jagosinski. Um, just that Kate and I went to the uh, WASB Legislative um, Day at the Capitol last Wednesday, and we had the um, pleasure of meeting with our Senator Jennifer Schilling and with um, Steve Doyle in the afternoon. Um, there were plenty of school board members and administrators um, from all over the state there. It was a really kind of an emotional roller coaster day. When I got back to work the next day, everybody said, oh, how was it? Did you have fun? And it's, no, it wasn't fun, but it was really, really important. And you really felt like your one unpaid day from work was really well worth it. So um, yeah, and unfortunately I grabbed this and I didn't grab all the other notes that I had. From <laughs> but I did forward, a, um, they had a really informative PowerPoint that we got from the um, budget presentation that morning and I had emailed WASB because they were supposed to have it available on the website and they didn't so I got an email back this morning and I forward that to all of you and you should have that PowerPoint um, presentation in your emails tonight so it has a lot of good detail that I wasn't even aware of and of course there's a lot that she explained while she was giving the presentation that's not included in the PowerPoint but um, Kate or I am sure could point out some of the things that were explained to us if you need that but really informative so I will um, get my other handouts too and get them to everyone if you would like to take a look which I hope you would and that, I'm pretty shook up so that's all I have time for <laughs> okay thank you I'm Kate Mayer um, ditto with Anita um, it, okay. it was an emotional day mm -hmm. um, just seeing hundreds of people from across the state, hundreds of school board members who have budgetary cuts worse than ours and they really don't know what to do. Stories of loss of counselors and special ed teachers and on and on and on. It, it is a reality of what's happening in the state and there, there were men and women 
that were very emotional. Um, so it was good for us. It helped inform us to understand what this budget is doing to public education. And, um, you know, I'm appreciative of Nita and many of the other people. I mean, I'm retired, so I could take my day off and still get my social security, but <laughs> you had to take a day off without pay, and I appreciate that you did that for our board. <coughs> I, I would like to add also that the district did get a free hotel room. Uh, yeah. Because um, Tell that Kate and story. I went through two uh, fire drills. That was oh. exciting. <laughs> Twelve thirty, so. we had to put on our booties and go outside. <laughs> oh, yeah. Instead of a hundred and twenty dollars. <laughs> and um, we were on the sixth floor and couldn't use the elevator. And oh. saying that was a long climb back up. Yeah. <laughs> Twelve dollars for parking, so we did a pretty good. Job. <laughs> You're welcome. We were All right. Cheap That's right. Yes, we were. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Menninger, Tim. Just real quick this evening and, and kind of a follow-up. Um, <clears throat> I got on this board nine years ago basically because of a, a passion for student learning and for the kids. And I think it's really important right now that everybody does pay attention. And certainly thanks to Kate and Anita for taking time to go down to Madison. But I think it's really important. And, and those of who watch the board for a while know that you know I'm sometimes outspoken on both sides of issues or both sides of the spectrum because I try and keep the kids front and center of ideology and I think that's really important to keep in mind right now that I think somehow in all the rhetoric on both sides the kids are getting forgotten in the middle and we need more people remembering that in Madison so I thank them for their time in doing that thank you Tim uh, Lisa Collins um, I don't have anything to add Okay, Gary Dunlap. Uh, just like to wish everyone happy spring. Really? I'm sorry for the snow. <laughs> I was on vacation, and when I came back, I brought all the snow back. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I apologize. <laughs> uh, congrats to uh, Roger King, uh, well deserved award, and and we're all very proud of him. Congratulations to Holman as the number one city in the state for young families. That was a mm -hmm. very nice prize. Not not a surprise to us who live in Holman, of That's course. That's right. But. Are, are you a are you young thinking you're a young family? Yes, I'm a young family. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to start over. No, <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, ad ad try to get everyone to go out and support the referendum questions that are coming up for a vote here very soon. Uh, support the school district. Uh, we wouldn't be coming and asking for the money if we didn't need it. And then uh, see you at the Renaissance dinner Thursday night. Uh, Nick's going to be our victim. I mean, oh, uh, yeah, server. At Nick's, he's at Nick's. Table. You're sitting there. I've been asking you for <laughs> nine years to sit at my table. Well, you probably know why I'm not going <laughs> to. Okay, is that oh. it, Gary? Okay. <laughs> Tom. Thank you for uh, your passion and your information, Kate and Anita, and going down to the Capitol. I, um, I'm still learning a lot, and um, I have my reasons. and. I guess they're more for business reason, and I, I just, I do what I do because I think we have a great district, and I think we have room for improvement. We all do. We're human, and today is my grandson's eight-week birthday. Oh, so, very fat, which is very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, any okay. Then I also wanted to congratulate Roger King. I thought that was great. Um, Great recognition. I know not too long ago his students were here and presenting, and and I think we see that there's a strong leader um, in Roger, and um, that has been there for many years. Um, as Gary mentioned, this is our last meeting before we go to vote on April 7th, and so I would ask for support of the referendum questions. Please vote. I think as Dr. Carlson says at the meetings, the most important thing is to hear from our electorate, to hear from our members of the community and get feedback. Um, but I'm very, um, I feel very positive about what I've been hearing from folks, and I hope that means a successful um, election on April 7th and Kate and Anita are on the ballot as well unopposed I might add um, so we aren't going to be having our usual um, candidate forum I would mention that we did the uh, personnel and governance committee did meet um, and Alex was there we did talk a bit about the um, student representative on board and the committee has copies of other area board member or other area boards um, policies and we feel there's some area for some tweaks um, certainly no changes uh, that 
I think the feedback I received was leaving the voting and the seconding and the motion, motioning as it is, but maybe our policy could be improved with better description of job descriptions and expectations and those sorts of things. So we may be doing a little bit of work on that um, with the, with the um, policy. Was I supposed to bring up the other one? State or the tournaments? Not We're still doing okay. Yeah, we are going to be seeing probably the attendance at state tournaments and clinics coming before us. Just um, some conversation we've been having in light of the state tournaments that happen. You know, it's usually boys basketball, the big snowstorm that it, yeah. is pretty um, pretty routine, I think, in the state of Wisconsin from year to year. So I think that's all that I have. Um, with that being done, I would just note that the red correspondence folder is going through with a couple, a letter um, from a, a community member and then um, copies of the cards that Dr. Carlson sent to those who um, participated <coughs> under public participation. Um, you received a written report from personnel and governance. I would also note that um, coming up as mentioned, March 26th is the meeting at CESA. Please let Christina know tonight if you plan to attend. March 30th, we have a special board meeting. Um, it is an extra Monday, so we're going to take advantage of that, and we will be discussing the district administrator search, um, strategy questions, those sorts of things. So please, it starts at 6, so please uh, mark your calendar. And it is here, yeah, in the boardroom. And then April 13th and 27th are the regular board meetings. Um, board meeting reflections, any comments? I just wanted to mention one thing about the, uh, the referendum education um, round tables that we've been having. There is one more. Yes. Um, coming up on the 31st at 7 o'clock at the high school. And just the last two that we've had, one was an early morning, about three three or so weeks ago, and we didn't we didn't have anyone come, so we were not quite sure how to interpret that. If that meant people were feeling confident that they knew a lot about the referendum, or if that just meant it was a bad time, we weren't quite sure. Um, the second session was, was that last week or two weeks ago, last week, um, and that we had several people, but you know there just weren't people barging through the doors to come to these, and they're really pretty amazingly um, informational. I mean, uh, I sat through uh, as a kind of a practice round each of the um, department heads kind of talking about their, their piece of the referendum and it was, it was great. I wish that everyone in the district could see those. Um, we've been doing some tables at um, the schools in the district. We're gonna continue to do that at teacher <coughs> conferences to give information out about the referendum. And we've had some of the boards that you'll see here on the uh, buildings and grounds and the fleet replacement piece and I think the pictures really draw people in because they want to be able to see the tangible things versus a lot of the the words um, and people were really inquiring a lot about those boards and so um, and a lot of people didn't know about the referendum actually um, so it was it was surprising um, had kind of forgotten about it and life is very busy but um, you know, to, to look up a bunch of details on a website sometimes isn't that easy. So talking to your neighbors and family and friends and people in the community that you know, I think is the best way to get the word out about it. So are any of the presentations um, taped and put on our website? I know that other districts, when we went to state, had, had done that so that people can I think in part of us having Jan present at the last meeting and then the presentations tonight was so that if people wanted to see those presentations, they would have access to those on online. Mm -hmm. But I don't think they've been cut and put together as a, yeah. which I don't know if that would be difficult for Christina to do, but. Um, well, and there's a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. The round tables are pretty individualized with a lot of kind of yeah. personalized discussion too, so I'm not sure how that would Oh, that would be like the presentations here that we could yeah. do. Sure. But I know sometimes we're insulated and um, because we are undergoing discussion on a topic, we think everybody's aware of it. But I think, as Lisa we're said, there, it's really we need to really talk to, to folks and just educate them and help them give them information about the referendum, the questions, that sort of thing. I would note a thank you to the Lacrosse Tribune for their. Um, 
editorial a few days ago in support of the referendum, and they are very, um, they usually do their research, and they're very particular about giving those out, so we did appreciate that, and I know that the um, editorial board met with our leadership folks, um, so thank you for doing such a great job that they responded affirmatively. So then with that, I would, um, Mrs. Mayor, if you would read the executive session motion. Absolutely. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851C for the purpose of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility, in this case, base wage negotiations, benefits, and change in employment status. Okay, is there a second? Second. And then, Kate, would you do the roll call, please? Absolutely. Cheryl Hancock? Yes. Anita Jagosinski? Yes. Myself, yes. Tim Menninger? Yes. Lisa Collins? Yes. Barry Dunlap? Yes. And Tom Cruise? Yes. Okay, we will reconvene in closed session in about four minutes.